Hi everyone, this is our channel Around My Story. Please like, share and subscribe. There are different kinds of pranks. Some are funny, some are boring, and some have serious consequences. My small innocent prank turned into a horror movie. Let me tell you why. My name is Anita, and I'm 14 years old. I live with my parents and my brother Victor. Victor is three years younger than me. We are also close friends. I love reading, writing stories, and most of all, playing pranks on people. I just love to do it. Victor was the cowardly sort, afraid of his own shadow. So I always played pranks on him. His terrified reactions always made me laugh. Whenever he would try to play a prank on me in retaliation, though, I would always see through it immediately. My parents used to spend Halloween at my aunt's house. So, one day, I decided to scare him by dressing up like a ghost and hiding in his closet. When he came home and called for me, I didn't reply. He entered his room and opened his closet to hang his coat, only to be confronted by me jumping out and screaming boo in his face. He leapt backwards, wide-eyed and terrified. He screamed like a girl. I was rolling on the floor, laughing. If he wasn't such a coward, I wouldn't have had any fun at home. One day, he joked, your pranks are going to be the death of me. When he turned 17, Victor received a scholarship to the state university. I saw him off with tears in my eyes, hugged him, and gave him a present marked don't open until you arrive at your dormitory. Shortly after he arrived, he video called. He had blue powder all over his face and looked hilarious. He said, very funny, ha ha ha. You have to stop these pranks, sis. We're too old for this stuff now. Oh, how I missed him. I laughed. With him gone, everything was so boring. When October came and Halloween was only a few days away, the doorbell rang, and I opened the door to find a letter lying on our doorstep. I opened it and found a picture of Victor. His face had been beaten black and blue. He looked horrible. I opened the letter and read, Victor got involved in drug dealing and now owes us a lot of money. If you don't pay off his debts as soon as possible, we will kill him, and you too. Do not call the police, or he will only die sooner. Panicked, I called the thug's phone number, written at the end of the letter, but there was no answer. Victor was such a sweet and innocent guy. I couldn't believe he had gotten himself involved in drug dealing. I thought of calling my parents, but I decided not to, because they would definitely call the police. So I spent the next two days thinking. Then, the home phone rang, and I felt my heart sink to my feet. I slowly picked up the receiver. Do you have the money? The caller asked in a cold voice. I need more time. I don't have that much money, I pleaded. The voice replied. You seem to think we are joking. Okay, the next photo we send you will be that of your brother's dead body. He said that. Then he hung up the phone. My stomach crunched. I felt sick and tried to call my parents, but I couldn't reach them. The next day, I heard a knock on the door, and when I opened it, there was another note lying on the doorstep. It read, The angel of death comes today. My parents were at my aunt's. I was alone and didn't know what to do. I closed all the windows and curtains and locked all the doors. I turned off the lights. At the stroke of midnight... I heard a noise outside my house. I peeked out a window and saw a man, all in black, in my front yard. He was walking towards the back of the house. Shortly after that, I heard the back door open. I ran and hid myself in the closet. Eventually, I heard my bedroom door open slowly. I heard footsteps walking around my room, as if the intruder were searching for me. Suddenly, my closet door opened. I panicked, pushed the masked intruder, and dashed out of my room and down the hall to the dining room. Victor's decapitated head was on the table. Oh my god. My last thought before I fainted was that if the drug dealers were going to kill me too, just as they promised. Goodbye life, I thought. When I woke up, I saw my parents and Victor, dressed in black. They all began laughing hysterically. Angry, I snapped. What's going on? Why are you all laughing? This isn't funny. Victor confessed between laughs. It was just a prank, sis. 
and you should have seen the look on your face when I opened the closet door. From that day on, I never played pranks on anyone ever again. I am addicted to food. I suffer a lot. I need help. I've tried to give up, but I fail every time. Hamburgers. Who can give up eating hamburgers, especially with barbecue sauce? I didn't mind this kind of addiction, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me begin by introducing myself. I am Patricia, 15 years old, living with my parents and my brother. I lead a quiet life. No interests, no hobbies, except for eating, that is. Food is my faithful friend. It never leaves me. It is my partner, my soulmate. But having food as your soulmate has insidious side effects. A dark side, if you will. It denies me a healthy life, robs me of the energy to play, and causes me to sleep excessively. I would much rather stay at home with a bag of potato chips than go out and exercise. My soulmate ultimately betrayed me, though, last Thanksgiving at my granny's home. She lives in a state nearby. Granny was a clever doctor and an excellent cook at that. She could conjure up something really delicious. On that day, she had prepared barbecue turkey with nuts and other secret recipe ingredients. The taste was so great, as if it had descended from heaven itself. I felt like I was fighting a food war, and I had to win at all costs. I ate and ate and ate. I don't know why, but I just couldn't control myself. I attacked that turkey like it was the last on the planet. But every culinary war with a worthy adversary, such as the barbecued turkey, has its own unique type of casualties. Suddenly, I found myself unable to breathe. I fell to my knees and passed out. The turkey had won. I woke up later in the hospital, though, still clinging to an unfinished turkey leg. The doctor told me that I was gaining way too much weight. He said that I should be put on a diet. Diet? Man, how I hated that word. It hung over my head like the sword of Democles. It meant depriving me of my passion, my reason for living. I considered eating vegetables in small amounts to be the worst form of cruel and unusual punishment, the worst form of torture imaginable. Imagine thinking of a wonderful, greasy, cheese-laden pizza with all the toppings and then suddenly opening your eyes to find a healthy green salad bowl. But I had reached a turning point in life. One day, my brother was playing on the street. While I was sitting at home, gazing longingly at a tempting piece of cheesecake, just sitting there, taunting, daring me to eat it, I struggled mightily to resist the urge. But in the end, I succumbed and wolfed it down like a starving animal. Shortly afterwards, I began feeling dizzy, but I was unable to call for help this time. And then, I passed out again. I was taken to the hospital. While lying in the hospital bed, half-conscious, I overheard the doctor say to someone, she needs to stop eating or it will be the death of her. I thought to myself, whoa, death? So I made up my mind right then, right there. I resolved to fight a new war, a war against my appetite. On our way back home, I told my father that I wanted to see a nutritionist. He was delighted to hear that. Later, at the clinic, the doctor welcomed us in. She told me how to overcome my eating fetish. She gave me a strict diet regimen with a schedule full of healthy meals. I kept telling myself that winning this war was possible. I simply had to be patient and persevere. I stuck to the strict diet and did some physical workouts. My parents supported me wholeheartedly. I was enthusiastic. I can totally do this. A week passed quickly, and I eagerly visited the doctor to receive some good news. When the doctor weighed me and told me that my weight hadn't changed at all, I was crestfallen. She looked at me and asked me, how was this possible? I told her I didn't know, because I was following her diet thoroughly, though it did require a tremendous effort on my part. Another week passed, and again I went to the doctor. The results were the same. She said to me, Patricia, are you sure you're following the diet I prescribed for you? I said yes. She sat there wondering. Then she told me with a puzzled look on her face, It's odd, but your weight is increasing, not decreasing. This unexpected piece of news mystified me. Another week passed. No change. The doctor was nonplussed. I returned home with a dejected look on my face. My father asked me what was wrong. And when I told him, he laughed. Do you believe that? My father actually laughed at my predicament. I was furious. He gestured an apology with his hand and then told me that it was my own fault. 
I was puzzled. What are you talking about? He told me that I had been sleepwalking to the refrigerator every night and eating everything in sight. I was taken aback. I couldn't believe it. Stop acting like he didn't know it, he said. You must have been awake. I replied, no, father, I'm not acting. I was truly unaware that I've been sleepwalking and eating in my sleep. But now that we've finally solved the mystery of the increasing weight, we returned to the doctor with this new information and told her the situation. She laughed and told me that my discipline had denied my body the food it craved, but my brain had refused to cooperate and had overridden my will by urging me to eat in a subconscious state. She told me not to worry, though, that she could treat that. Armed with this knowledge and her support, and the support of my family, I felt that I could finally win this war. Hi, my name is Laura. I'm 23 years old, and I teach art. I recently got married to the love of my life, Norman. I considered him my friend, my brother, my son, and my husband. We love to prank each other, even after we got married. For instance, one time, I turned off all the lights in the apartment, dressed up as a monster, and scared the living daylights out of him when he came back from the store. Another time, he damaged my car. I put mayonnaise on his toast. I did worry sometimes that our jokes might go too far. I mean, he did get really mad at me once. He stopped talking to me for two days, even though I apologized profusely many times. After that, our pranks sort of stopped. I figured our pranking days were over. About a month later, I returned home to find a letter on the floor. I opened it and read it. If you don't pay us a hundred thousand by Friday, we will kill Norman. I smiled. Norman was pranking me again. When he returned home, I hugged him and showed him his prank letter. He read it carefully, and his bro furrowed. He appeared seriously frightened and swore that this was not part of any prank. He told me that we needed to leave town as soon as possible. I asked him why, and he told me that before he married me, he had stolen a gold statue from a motorcycle gang. I asked him why he couldn't just return it with an apology, and he told me that the statue was worth a lot of money and could make us really wealthy. That night, an armed masked burglar broke into our apartment and confronted us with a gun. He said to Norman, Hello, Norman, long time no see. You need to choose between the statue or your wife. Choose now. Norman was hesitant. Then he steadfastly said, I can't give up the statue. Take my wife. The masked man turned towards me. He pointed the gun at me in a threatening manner. I was frantic. I was staring at Norman in shock. Suddenly, the masked man ripped off his mask. It was Keanu, Norman's brother. Norman sat down, laughing so hard he could hardly stop to breathe. Between laughs, he said, This is payback for the last prank of yours. I was so mad at him that day, but it's all right. He doesn't know what I have planned for him. Hello, I'm Sarah. Ever heard of a phobia before? Don't worry, it's not contagious or anything. It just means you're scared of something in particular. Places, people, things. I have a phobia, but I don't like to talk about it. And I definitely don't want to be seen in that state. I was in my second year at college. I had been very busy that semester because we had a lot of assignments. And it was fine, I mean, I liked studying and completing tasks. But I was never a nerd or a geek. No, I like to dress nicely too. I have my own fashion and style. It wasn't easy making friends though. There were two types of people at my school. Smart nerds who couldn't care less how they dress and complete airheads who dress nice. I didn't fit in either one of those groups. So I basically kept to myself until one day I got assigned to do a task with a girl and a boy, Jane and Kyle. They didn't look nerdy at all. And I thought to myself, oh great, looks like I'll be doing all the work. But when we started talking about the project, they didn't just sit there or toss ridiculous retorts. All three of us were having an actual conversation about the topic. I was so thrilled. It finally seemed like I belonged somewhere. We became friends and did everything together. We could tell each other anything. Well, not everything. I had one secret for my friends. I never told them I had a phobia. Anyway, a year later, Jane moved to Germany with her parents. She was going to finish college there. So it was just Kyle and I now. All through college, we were the best of friends. We even did our graduation project together. On graduation day, Kyle and I were supposed to go out for dinner. He wouldn't tell me where, said it was a surprise. And what a surprise it was. He had picked the highest tower in the whole city to eat dinner at the very top. 
I don't have a problem with high places in particular. In fact, I'm sure I'll love the view if I ever make it to the top. No, I had a problem with the elevator. A phobia, to be precise. So we were standing at the base of the tower and Kyle was happily listing all the great features and restaurants up there, but I didn't hear any of it. I was too busy fretting, frozen to the spot, desperately trying to find a way out of the situation. I couldn't say no to Kyle, who was all excited to go up the tower, so I clenched it in and tried my best to stay calm. We got in the elevator and the doors shut. I couldn't control what came after that. I was terrified, screaming and shouting hysterically, banging on the walls, then falling to the ground. Of course, I don't actually remember any of it. Kyle told me later on. The last thing I remember was the elevator doors shutting close. When I came to, I was at the hospital. Kyle was sitting by my bed looking worried. When he saw that I woke up and that I was feeling fine, he started laughing at me, saying, why didn't you tell me you had a phobia? I felt ridiculous and started laughing too. And then out of nowhere, he proposed. It was his plan all along, although he pictured it at the top of the tower. All that happened three years ago. We're married now and we have a baby girl. I'm being treated for my phobia. It's not completely gone, but I'm way better now. Apparently, hiding my problems never solves them. I'll have to face them, sooner or later. It all happened on my last holiday. It was a terrible experience. It was the worst holiday I have ever had. Me and my friend Renee, we decided to go to New Zealand. We were saving money for a very long time to go on this trip. It was our dream to go to the land of the Lord of the Rings. We had made reservations for flight at the end of July. And from that moment on, everything went wrong. It turned out that the flight was reserved for only one person. Simply because a woman at the travel agency didn't understand us very well. I managed to reserve a flight, but a different one, so we couldn't go together. But I thought that it was not a big deal. My friend flew a few hours after me, I was going first. When I arrived at the airport, I was very happy because that meant that my holiday has just started and that nothing else could happen. And I was mistaken. When the hour of my flight was coming, I queued up to the custom clearance. My passport was right and the next thing I had to do was to go through the metal detector. When I was passing through, it started to beep. I was so scared. I was taken aside immediately. And I felt like a thief. It was terrible. The custom officer had taken me to another room and she told me to undress. I tried to explain that I had a belly ring and maybe it was the cause of the beeping but she didn't want to listen. I had to undress. They took my clothes somewhere else and I was standing alone in the middle of the room. I was shocked and stressed. The woman came back after about 5 minutes which seemed to be ages for me. She gave me back my clothes, but I was not allowed to put them on. She checked me one more time with a small metal detector, which was obviously beeping in front of my belly ring. Of course, the custom officials went through all of my things, but they didn't find anything. I was late for my flight, so I had to wait for another one. My friend was supposed to meet me at the airport, and it was me who should be waiting for her. She was terrified that I was not there. But fortunately, she decided to wait. After that horrible flight, we met at the airport and we went to our hostel. It turned out that we expected something different, but it was not that bad. And we were too tired to look for something else. New Zealand is the most beautiful country I have ever seen. And we loved everything about it. The people, their customs, their food, basically everything and the entire environment. We spent three weeks there. We had a really good time, but when the time ended we had to fly back home. I was a little bit scared. This time I decided to remove my belly ring. We came to the airport about 3 hours before the departure time. At the entrance to the airport we saw an older woman who had a large card with the word written on it with capital letters POLAND. So I came up to her and I started to speak in Polish. She smiled and we started to chat together. When we were just about to leave, she asked me if I could take a box of chocolates with me and give it to her son in Poland. He was supposed to meet me at the airport because she would phone him. And of course I agreed. And then it started again. 
At the custom clearance, everything was okay. I came through the metal detector and nothing happened. My passport was alright. I was almost free when the custom officer asked me about the chocolates. I said that it was given to me by the lady at the entrance and that her son is going to take it back at the airport in Poland. The custom officer asked me to open the box. I didn't want to agree as it was not mine. But I had to. It turned out that inside there were not chocolates, but cocaine worth $20,000. I was taken to jail. I spent two days there and then everything had been explained. I could come back home and the lady and her son were caught and also taken Before to jail. Before I got on the plane I don't from have Barcelona to, why to this talk you, was the I emailed the friend I was staying with. Please do not be shocked by my appearance. I look a little bit different. Also, I won't have any money when I arrive. So if you can help me sort it out, that would be great. The stitching on my face looked like someone had killed a black spider but left the corpse there. My appearance was shocking. I gasped with horror whenever I accidentally glimpsed at myself in the mirror. And that was before I even registered that it was me looking back. My face got worse on the plane ride to Tokyo. Whether it was just the cabin pressure or the time that was the bruises take to bloom, but my friend meeting me at a hotel in Tokyo blanched when he saw me. My eyes were black and swollen shut. One side of my face was also swollen and bruised, and a long line of black badly stitched thread ran down my right temple to my brow. I had been assaulted and robbed in Barcelona a few days before which resulted in two black eyes, a swollen jaw, and a fractured skull. Now dented and stitched together by an exhausted intern who would never win a prize for the neatness of his craft work. My friend in Tokyo was a lawyer who dealt with the complexities of transitional airline leases and wore tailored suits. We made an odd-looking couple as we went from bank to bank with my passport. Trying to get money out or get money wired or just access it somehow. In his flawless Japanese, he negotiated on my behalf as I stood there. My face a grotesque mask, but each time we were rebuffed in a 